Hello, my name is Eric Bolt. I'm the Warning Coordination Meteorologist for the National Weather Service in Los Angeles. And I'm going to give you an update on what El Nino is and what we're expecting on impacts for Southern California. First of all, the thing you should understand about El Nino is this is part of a cycle called the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO. So El Nino is the warm phase of this oscillation. And the other part of this is a cold phase called La Nina. This whole process takes about two to five years to go through the cold to the warm phase. And we are currently in the warm phase. So ever since March, we have been in El Nino. So if you're wondering when is it going to start, we're already underway. The Pacific Ocean continues to support these El Nino conditions. It's currently in a strong category. And it could rank among the top three strongest since 1950. This chart shows the normal Pacific pattern. On the left side of this chart is Australia, and on the right side is South America. Over the equator, you constantly have trade winds pushing warm water to the Western Pacific Ocean. That warming in the Western Pacific Ocean energizes the atmosphere, and that's where you get your storminess. And that creates this large circulation called the Walker Circulation across the Pacific Ocean. You have much colder water in the Eastern Pacific and less storminess. What happens during El Nino is those trade winds weaken or reverse direction. Therefore, you push that warm water eastward. So El Nino brings above normal sea surface temperatures to the central and eastern Pacific Ocean, and that energizes our atmosphere for more storminess closer to the southern part of the United States. A classic pattern of that would look like this. Basically, the jet stream is going to elongate across the eastern Pacific, tap into that storminess across the equator and bring storms out of the south into the southern part of the country. So therefore you have wetter conditions across the southern part of California and into the Gulf Coast region, and then drier conditions typically in the north. And overall, El Nino is a warm climate system, so we are going to have mild temperatures this winter. And it's important to remember that El Nino is a climate change, climate system that's happening, not a, not a weather event, not a storm. So El Nino doesn't necessarily bring a storm to California. It's going to direct more numerous storms from the south into Southern California. And we often look at sea surface temperatures, and this is looking at how much warmer than normal it is across the Eastern Pacific. So that rectangular box is the area monitored for El Nino. And the latest reading was at 2.9 degrees Celsius, which doesn't seem like a lot of temperature change. But to be in a strong category El Nino, you only need to be at 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we're way above that now, and the signature is to continue to be in a strong category this winter. Another thing is it's not just the surface that's warm, it's the depth of the ocean. This is a cross-section, again, of the equator looking from the Western Pacific to the Eastern Pacific. As you get east of the Dateline, you see a lot of warm temperature anomalies going down as deep as 1,500 feet below the surface of the ocean. This is why this is a climate event. It takes many months for this to get in place, and this is what's going to happen to impact our storms this upcoming winter. A lot of question about how strong this El Nino is. So we've only been measuring this uh, events since 1950. The two strongest events are on this chart. 1997-98 in blue was the strongest ever recorded. The green is 1982-83. And the black line is where we currently are. So we're right in second place. Uh, there's potential for us to exceed the strongest uh, measurement of 1997-98. And you should also note that as we get out of the winter months and into the spring and summer, the El Nino uh, reflection goes away. We could be back into a neutral or even a La Nina uh, phase by we get into the summer and next fall. Prediction-wise looks like this. On the left side of the chart is where we're at. The yellow line is a consensus of many different computer models. And it shows we're going to stay in the, the strong category over the winter months. And then again, weaken into maybe a neutral category by this summer. A very classic El Nino uh, prediction. Well, how much rain does that equate to? We can't really give you an, uh, an exact number of how much 
uh, precipitation we're going to have. But this is an idea we have to look at what's happened in the past. These are the six strongest El Ninos measured since 1950. Every one of them, for downtown Los Angeles, has been well above normal. Normal is about 15 inches every year. And you can see how every event, especially the two strongest events, 1982-83 and 1997-98, uh, well over uh, 30 inches or double the precipitation of normal. So if we stay in this, this category and we're neck and neck with that strong El Nino signature, we could be in the same realm as far as precipitation uh, by the end of the year. The other bars next to this, the four preceding the actual El Nino, was just to give you an idea of how much precipitation we had or didn't have leading into the El Nino. Another idea <coughs> is where is the rain? Why hasn't it started raining yet? This is a chart here that shows basically all those six strong El Ninos of the past. The green line is what typically has happened on average. The black line is where we're at. And you can see uh, 1997, 98 in the orange color, and 82, 83 in kind of the purpley color. So we're still very early in the game here, early December. Uh, we are kind of on the low end of things, but there's plenty of time yet to make up uh, precipitation amounts. And you can see in the past, we've had quite a bit of precipitation once we get into January, February, and March. So we're anticipating that to start up this year as well. Visually, you can look at the whole state and see how the rain uh, panned out for those six strong events of the past. Again, the two strongest ones are the lower left and the lower right of this chart. Uh, everybody in the whole state benefited with above normal precipitation, sometimes 200% of normal, including a very large snowpack in the mountains in the Sierras. However, a couple of those strong events right here in the middle, uh, some parts of the state, in fact, two-thirds of the state, was actually below normal precipitation during those strong events. So not every El Nino is the same. We won't have the very same uh, result as we've seen in the past. Some of these could be uh, less precipitation across Northern California. And that's fairly significant because those are some of our largest reservoirs uh, and water supply resources for the state of California. So if we don't have the precipitation in those areas, uh, that could be a negative for our strong El Nino. Uh, what's going on with the snowpack in the northern Sierra? This is a measurement of that. The blue shaded area is what we could anticipate as an average snowpack. The dark blue line there at the bottom is where we are currently. It's about 60% of normal. Uh, 90, uh, actually, last year's snowpack is in red, so you can see we're a little bit behind that. Uh, but we're starting to see more storminess come into northern California and the Pacific Northwest. So these numbers should ramp up quite quickly. As far as the official forecast for the wintertime months of January, February, March, which again is our wettest months typically, uh, we do have greater than 60% chance of being above normal for these uh, upcoming uh, rainy months, especially across Southern California. But as you go into Northern California, that signal goes away and it's actually on the drier side across the Pacific Northwest. Temperature wise, there's no surprise here. Uh, we've been much above normal for many years. That's why we've had our drought. And again, El Nino is a warm phenomenon, so we are expecting warmer than normal temperatures across most of California this upcoming winter. So in conclusion, anytime we talk about El Nino, we are tilting the odds of being above normal for Southwest California on rainfall. A strong category increases those odds, and it could be one of the strongest. We have to remember that one El Nino most likely will make a, uh, a large dent, but not end our drought. And then until we see soaking rains across all areas, uh, we still have a very large wildfire threat. Uh, the fuels are very dry. Uh, we've been in this long-term drought, and we still have potential for some Santa Ana winds that could cause wildfires. So some of the impacts we can expect during El Nino, again, more numerous storms is the big factor, especially January, February, March, maybe even into April. Uh, one of the things we're seeing are high tides, um, exceptionally high. El Nino warms the water, which actually brings us more water to our coast just because of that uh, change. So we should see more coastal flood problems uh, this winter time. 
And then some of those bigger storms could cause structural damage and damage to piers and uh, maybe even residents that are right close to the ocean. So there's potential for that this winter. And then floods. Not every El Nino has resulted in major flooding. So we have to keep that in mind. We don't anticipate flooding unless we get these storms to come one after another. Sometimes we call that a pineapple express. We'll have three or four storms lined up one after the other after two or three of those storms, we can't handle any more water because we're oversaturated. And then we have a lot of water runoff and a lot of widespread flooding. That's the potential this winter. That's something we'll be keeping an eye on as these storms come in. Another thing to remember is this message. Turn around, don't drown. Uh, believe it or not, flooding kills the most people. And most of those people are caught in their vehicles because they're trying to drive through moving water. You don't know how deep the water is. Uh, maybe the road has been scoured away. So anytime you see moving water in front of your vehicle, you don't want to risk it. You want to turn around, don't drown. The second highest uh, fatality threat from water is people walking in water. It only takes about six inches of water to wipe you off your feet and then you're in trouble. A vehicle will start to move with about a foot and a half to two feet of water. But the message remains, turn around, don't drown, anytime you see fast moving water uh, in front of your vehicle. So what should you do to prepare this winter? The main thing is stay aware of the weather predictions. Uh, that's really easy. On the internet, you can follow the National Weather Service at weather.gov slash Los Angeles. Uh, we're also very much into social media when we do have storms coming into the area. Also, we're gonna be putting the word out to the media so listen to uh, TV and radio as the media starts to talk about these storms coming in. So don't be surprised. Uh, just be aware of when these storms are expected. Some of the things you can do now is improve the drainage and the water issues around your house that you know about. Uh, maybe fix a, a, a leaky roof or get some sandbags to divert water away from your house if you've had past trouble with that. You should always have an emergency kit just like you're ready for earthquakes. If the power goes out, you may need several days of food and water and other uh, emergency items to take care of yourself. Many people are talking about flood insurance. Check with your agency uh, for insurance purposes on what's covered at your house. Typically flood water is not included with your normal insurance. You might have to have a flood insurance policy. And remember it takes 30 days for that to take effect. And then know how to receive warnings from National Weather Service. Uh, again, listen to the media or pick up a free app. FEMA or the American Red Cross have great apps that will alert you whenever we issue a watch or a warning. And let's talk about that. There's sometimes confusion about what the difference is, is between a watch and a warning. So, as a storm is approaching and the ingredients are coming together to cause some flood issues because we've already had rain, we're expecting more heavy rain coming in, we're gonna issue a flash flood watch. Usually that's about 12 to 48 hours in advance. And that's when the potential exists for something bad to happen later on. So stay alert and be informed about uh, the watch that's been issued. Then when we get into a situation where we're watching the radar, we're seeing storms come into the area, uh, that's when we may have to issue something called a flash flood warning. And this is the most dangerous situation. This is a threat to life and property. Your lead time could be less than an hour. And that's when you need to move to high ground or take other actions to save your life or property. This is when we're gonna be setting off all the alarms. NOAA weather radio, that's something that is monitored by the media. They record the warning message and then rebroadcast it over the air, interrupting TV and radio. That's called the emergency alert system. And then if you have a smartphone these days, uh, if you're in the area that we draw a box for the warning area, uh, your smartphone will go off and send a tone to your phone and also a, a short message about what's going on. And then a lower threshold, something that's also occurring, but it's got basically a lower level of threshold to it. It's called an advisory. These often come out first uh, as the rain starts to pick up in intensity. We see ponding of water and low-lying uh, water issues. 
a, more of a nuisance variety event compared to the warning. So that's what I have for you. I appreciate your time uh, and listening to this presentation. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me. There's our website and also our social media listed below. Uh, we're very active on Twitter at, at NWS Los Angeles and also on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to prepare for the El Nino conditions. As a LAWA employee or stakeholder, LAWA Emergency Management Division also recommends the following emergency preparedness tips for severe weather conditions. First, get a kit. A good emergency kit includes food, water, and medications to last you at least 72 hours. Be sure to include a flashlight and spare batteries in case you lose power. Don't forget your pets. Make a plan. Emergencies can be confusing and chaotic. An emergency plan helps you know what to do and where to go if disaster strikes. Prepare your vehicle for wet winter weather. Ensure tires, brakes, and windshield wipers are in proper working condition. Keep an emergency kit in your car, too. Listen to forecasts and advisories from local officials. Before a storm, you may be asked to avoid certain areas at risk for flooding or mudslides or delay setting trash cans out on the street. Register to receive emergency alerts via text message, voice message, or email at notifyla.org and follow at notifyla on Twitter to receive emergency alerts on your timeline. Finally, LAWA 411 is our method to communicate with our employees on the airport status and alerts.